Hi, y'all. Uh, thank you for joining um, us for Peer Kids of the um, Houston Cinema Arts Festival for 2020. I am Tony Nguyen, um, part of Pleasure Style Attitude, a duo from Dallas. Um, and uh, we are a partner for this um, screening with Peer Kids. And we have um, with us the amazing duo, Elegance Brennan and Chester Gordon for this uh, discussion. Uh, thank you all for um, having the opportunity for this conversation. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so much. Awesome. Um, well, I um, we can just start things off then. Um, Elegance, I've read before that um, you have a photography background um, and you are inf influenced by photographers that actually double as filmmakers such as Nan Golden and Gordon Parks. Can you talk about how photography has informed your practice, uh, filmmaking practice, and with Pure Kids specifically? Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, that would be a great question. I absolutely am a photographer filmmaker, I believe. I, at the foundation of what I do as a visual artist is rooted in the photography of it all. I mean, really, truly, it's rooted in the writing. I've always been a writer. Before I even took photos, I was a poet. And I self-published a book that about 1,500 people have. I don't know where they're at, but at some point I'm at, I hope they'll come back and show me the book. But, um, you know, writing with light is the basis of photography, right? That's what that word means in Greek. So for me, photography is rather lighting and film and composition, the frame itself, how you use the frame to communicate uh, deep and meaningful ideas and messages. Uh, I had a great mentor, I have a great mentor in Tom, Thomas Roma, who's a wonderful American photographer. And I remember in, at, at class, we were in class together at Columbia, and he said that each photograph you take should have, um, like be like a journal entry. It should reveal something about yourself that you wish you could take back, that you wish you didn't say out loud, you know? And, um, and having that kind of relationship to the medium is very much informs how I, act as a filmmaker. I believe in a principle of God, fear, and sex. You know, pretty much everything I make has some combination of one or all three of those things. And I try to use the frame as a way to push buttons in the viewer to get them to uh, think about and experience the world as my characters do on screen. Um, so that's the general. And then specifically for peer kids, you know, this film, there is a version of this cut where you actually, because I, I shot it on SLRs and SLRs can go from video to photography very easily. So a bunch of the footage you see is wrapped up in shutter stops of photographs that I took. And uh, while I was shooting this film, I published my first photo book, Bound by Night. And Bound by Night is really truly a companion piece to Peer Kids, right? And that very many of the moments that you watch in Peer Kids you have photographs from around those moments in the photo book. Um, but I'm going to be publishing another photo book of Peer Kids as well, where um, you'll see even more photography that is inspired. So it's, it's really, really connected for me in my practice, the, the photographic image and the moving image. I, 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 I use photographs like people use storyboards, you know? So it's, it's very much that way. I'm so excited to see this photo book come out. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, just by the photographers that I, that you were influenced by, just as by like Nan Golden, Gordon Parks, I could definitely see how the, the rawness and intimacy just reminded me so much of uh, what Peer Kids really is. And um, just, I, um, yeah, but um, so I guess. Like, I just want to shout out real fast, like Kalika Law, I love mm -hmm. feel one of my favorite, favorite, favorite documentaries and photo books. You know, mm -hmm. I love, I'm very much compelled by Robert Maplethorpe's work. I don't know about the person that much, but the work I find to be really informative. So, you know, those photographers mean a lot to me, Gordon and Nan, and I, I so appreciate that. But also people are watching and want to look up cool stuff. Kalika Law is amazing. He's someone I admire. No, we appreciate the shout out. <laughs> um, so I guess my next question was, um, I guess it's directed to both of you, but what was it like securing financing for Peer Kids? Since it's a film that's not 
focused on the the ball the ball itself or the general uh, aesthetics of queerness, but more so just like the like the everyday um, everyday life of just these trans and queer youth, but especially these black trans queer youth. Sure. So Elegant secured over $40,000 through a Kickstarter campaign. And then after that, he filmed for a couple of years. Uh, then we added our own money to the pot and also got a grant from Tribeca and Pond5 uh, to finish the film. And I think that, you know, most of the funding that was secured for the film came from the Kickstarter. So ultimately it was the people who believed in the movie through the, you know, large crowdfunding campaign, you know, the share, mm -hmm. uh, constant communication with the people who were helping fund the movie and who believed in the stories that were being told, you know? Yeah. And, um, when it comes down to it, I think, I mean, I made this movie as an undergrad. So, and I was studying like queer studies and I mean, I was an African-American <laughs> studies major, but I used African-American studies as a, a, a lens to think of everything in the world, right? From European history to science to, um, you know, art, what have you. So this film is like, you know how they say when you're, when you're young is when you're most liberal, right? This is me going to the black queer students group and talking about the white gays for hours on end and being really, really upset about it and, and angry and determined to, to do it differently than white people do it, you know? So, um, so and that definitely impacted my fundraising, <laughs> you know? Right, I was just gonna ask, it's like the general obstacles because I can only imagine you know, when you were shooting this, this was like pre-pose, pre-legendary. So like, I can't imagine it's just a completely different field in, in terms, I guess, like, again, it's not uh, so much of a focus on like the queer, uh, the aesthetics of uh, queerness, but more of like the actual like everyday life. Well, I mean, I, 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 would, I would say that it is very much about the aesthetics of queerness. Like the moments mm -hmm. when you're, about, you're alone with Crystal and she's getting changed, mm -hmm. right? you see the building blocks of those aesthetics of queerness. You see what is absolutely essential in those aesthetics of queerness when you're focused on people who, um, you know, from an economic point of view, have some limited resources, right? So that first thing that Crystal grabs, you know, her, her hair on her counter next to her bag of weed, you know, like when we watch The Queen, we see hair on counters next, and we know the weed in the room. We don't necessarily see the weed in the room, but, you know, so, and I, and I wanted to say that, like, I really, what I love about Nan Golden and Gordon Parks and Helen Levitt and, and many others who, who are like that style, is they elevate the mundane into the realm of the aesthetic, right? Like when you watch a guy like John Waters' films, you know, there's these people, these women are doing things that you see women do <laughs> all the time in your day-to-day -day life, right? But he's getting inside of those moments of going to the hair salon or going shopping for clothes or even really being famous, being starlet and all, all, all the things that John Waters talks about are very much mundane, common things that, especially when he's focusing on feminists, right? That many femmes do, but it's John's point of view on those aesthetics that makes it come to life. And, you know, not to say that pure kids, I'm, I mean, I love these filmmakers and I hope one day to be really truly be in a conversation with them. But I do think that there is aesthetics in the mundane. There is, you mm -hmm. know, being focused on the real day-to-day -day life, you actually get to see the aesthetics as they are inhabited versus as they're applied. You know, and I think that's mm -hmm. and lastly just want to say like yes, it was pre-pose and yes, it was pre-legendary, but Peer Kids is also pre-my house, right? My mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. TV show that we had about, you know, queer black youth in the ballroom scene, right? And in that situation, you know, we actually were before Pose with that show, you know? So in terms of like, when you talk about it from a financing point of view, financing is about awareness. There are a lot of, you know, Sean's and Ryan's and Mike's and Bob's and John's who, and Sarah's who like, and, you know, all sorts who actually are the gatekeepers. And for them, 
it's just, it's, you know, it's a, it's a combination of unconscious bias and a conscious decision by the filmmaker myself to go in a different path and how I told my story that create a scenario where, you know, I've had many people tell me throughout the eight years of the Finnish peer kids like, oh, um, why aren't they dancing more? This ball stuff is great. Mm -hmm. yeah, people mm -hmm. happy. Do any of them go to college? Like I had one person suggest to me at school like that at the end of the day, you know, when you show this movie to place it like, you know, high end festivals, right? That a part of your responsibility as a black filmmaker is to assure the predominantly white people who are the gatekeepers that they are not racist. And the way you do that is by upending their expectations and stereotypes, which is, I mean, in short, how black people navigate and people of color navigate in a white world, right? But within conversation of the business, you know, these expectations determine how much money projects get, how much, even when they get, we were at Viceland and we were barely promoted, mm -hmm. you know, be more than a bunch of other stuff they made, but certainly not in the conversation at Action Bronson, a straight white guy who does hip hop, you know? So when you start to be intentional about these things, it's very, it's very, very easy to get sidelined by the industry. But that's the thing about, you know, doing this work is that if white people were interested in this, in making this work, then it would we would we wouldn't be having these conversations about representation. Yeah. I also think to add to that, I think peer kids is like a, a time capsule and it's like a conversation in time that you know is being had with the film The Queen, Paris is Burning, Mira Mira, mm -hmm. How Do I Look? Yes. Uh, you know, all of these films right. about, you know, these queer lives specifically the trans women and gay men and you know people of color you know and they're not they're not they're i don't put any responsibility on these characters or any really characters that i write to upend white expectations of black life and it would rather what i would rather you do is actually live with us how white supremacy causes us to live and understand that we are still human and that you are human just like we are you know like that to me is a much more valuable medicine to this poison that the, this medium has been used to, to, to distribute in the world. And I think that, you know, take choosing that path, it, it's like any artist, you, it's, it's ebbs and flows, you know, I'm definitely in a fruitful, flowerful period, but Peer Kids was where my creativity was not matched with the enthusiasm from the industry that I thought I would find, you know? No, absolutely. Um, no, those are great points. And um, I'm glad that you not only stuck with your vision, but doubled down with it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, just in the back of my head when I was watching, I was just like, I can only imagine because, you know, with especially with like Black youth and queer Black youth, um, in terms, of, I guess, like pitching this film and the like, I just didn't see any class transformation um, with, the, with the youth, which I can only imagine that would be just be a harder obstacle to you know showcase and distribute and the like, um, but um, but I guess with that, um, my next question relatively ties to that, which is how do we preserve the ownership of the open space and the historical lineage of Christmas Street and the like um, with the general resistance that's being met with it, with gentrification and whitewashing and kind of paralleling to this time capsule. Is that how has the peer changed since you shot with the original footage? I mean, the peer is so different. I, I first went to the peer as a homeless 16 year old when my mother kicked me out for being gay. So back then the curfews had just started but they weren't really able to be enforced just yet because you had all these people around who had been used to being out there all night. So I was coming at the end of that. So from 96, to today, it's so very different because, you know, the gentrification has really set in. And gentrification is a, is a code word. It, it really truly means ethnic cleansing. And when we place, you know, value over the value of human life, well, there you go. Now you have some sort of class war, is how I see it, right? Where you people who are indigent lower property value by being present in public. So, you know, it's so different in that, for instance, the pizza place that you see in Peter Kids often, that pizza place is no longer around. That pizza place was the 
only spot, well, maybe the Chinese place by the water, right? Was one of two spots on that street where for under 20 bucks, you can get a whole meal, you know? And that's gone now. It's a police force that now, you know, Eric Garner and, you know, um, so many people who have been killed by these police have been killed since 1996. Amadou Diallo and, you know, um, Leilene Polanco lost her life. Trans Latinx woman lost her life. The Rikers, right? And this is a police force that has now had three decades. I mean, Stonewall itself was a response to police harassment, mm -hmm. right? So if we take the summer of 1969, the event that gives the gay rights movement, now we're saying 50 years of aggressive policing has set in into a culture where it is illegal to be black and brown outside at night on the pier. Your presence is criminal. So that these cops, that is the ruling ideology. There is no pushback to this thought. There is no, hey, wait a second. That's a kid who's starving, whose mother kicked him out, who needs help, right? No, this is a person who is dangerous because he lowers or, or they lower um, property value. Mm -hmm. So this type of aggressive policing, you know, you see, you see many people in this film who are bruised, right? Who've been in fights, who've experienced violence and, and peer kids. The police, their presence means to inflict violence on these youth for having no place to be. That's so different today than it was back then because back then it was kind of like a secret that that happened. They, you know, take you off onto the side and, and work you out a bit. And now it's like restaurant owners call and say, get this kid out who's asleep in front of my place, out in front of my place. And I get it from their point of view, but the point is police don't fix these types of problems. You know, we, we're citizens fix these problems in a democracy. We decide that we will not tolerate these the, the, that human life will be degraded by these conditions and we decide to fix it. Police are not there to fix those things. So, you know, the hyper-policing, everything is just, everything that has always been true about Christopher Street in New York City and America for black people, for homeless black queer people, remains to be true till this day. However, it has intensified to become better armed and has 24 hour surveillance and knows everything about you. And, you know, it's, it's illegal to even stand in the light on Christopher Street now. Like that pizza place used to be the only spot. That's why it's so prominent in my film because it's the only mm. spot that has a lot of available light, natural light. Well, you know, <laughs> I don't know if it's natural, but light at night. So people stand there so they could see each other better and just talk to each other. And people understood that, I remember one night I come by and everybody's standing in the darkness right next to the light. I'm like, why are you all standing outside of the light? I'm like, well, you know, the police told us that if we stand in the lit areas, then we're gonna all get searched. And I got this thing on my record and that thing on my record. I don't wanna go to jail tonight. So I'm gonna stand over here, you know? So at once you've got the resilience and the oppression side by side, you know? You wanna talk to him? Yeah, I think we covered it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was really extremely well said. Um, I'm glad you really had especially touched about the um, economic value, or I guess like the lesser economic value that these um, um, that these very vulnerable communities are being targeted to, just as like you know when there was the police escalation with the play fighting, it took to what twenty five to forty uh, police officers to try to de escalate, and of course um, that person's reason of why they felt that they were targeted is because they were just purely because of their purely because they were homosexual. Um, uh, so no, I'm glad that you um, especially touched about that. But um, we hear and feel from like so many different um, people in the film, um, but we seem to have like the greatest grasp, I would think, to you know Deshaun, Crystal, and Casper. What was it about these three that drew you both? Was it because y'all saw? a lot of you in them? Or is it just like their larger than life personalities or? What do you like about them? I think their honesty and willingness to be vulnerable. I think I love about all of them because of, I think that like, you know, 
they like Crystal like Crystal wanted to be in their friendship. Like Crystal, for instance, we're friends with Crystal. Crystal's like, you know, in order to make this movie, we have to be friends because of, you know, the gaze in which you're shooting from it has to be one that's friends with me and that's there for me, you know, basically. And I think that like, you know, that plays a huge part in that question, I yeah. guess. You know? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. But I feel like, yeah, they're all interesting. They're all well spoken about their what they've gone through, you know? Yeah. And they're and I just feel like how often do you meet people who tell you the absolute truth about their lives, you know? And even want to share stuff that could potentially help someone else that's going through the things that they're going through, you know? And I think that's the that's beautiful about you know them. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, that's absolutely true. They're my friends, number one. Like I, mm-hmm. I lots of these influences, like my favorite photographers photograph their friends. They photograph people mm-hmm. that they think are photogenic, <laughs> you know? So, right. So I, I was really compelled by them as individuals and I did see a lot of myself in them because, you know, I've, many of the things that happened to them are things that people said would happen to me for coming out my mother said, particularly, and other relatives who are homophobic said to me, you know, so see, like people thought I wanted to be a woman because I was gay. People, you know, um, underestimated my intelligence because I was black. People, you know what I'm saying? And like, and Deshaun is that person to me whose intelligence is totally underestimated by the world. And I totally 100% identify with that. And Casper, Crystal, I think, and all of them really, but those two in particular, I think, speak to the innocence of youth, especially at this time. Like Crystal, like who doesn't love the story? Like Madonna, you know, she's like the girl from Michigan, girl from Kansas City who goes to New York with 30 bucks in her pocket and maybe she doesn't become a pop star, but you know, there's something about that that I, as an American filmmaker, that I'm just really, really attracted to and compelled by and fascinated with and, and love to tell. So. You know, there's there's so many reasons they're in the film. You know, Crystal is kind of sort of a Republican that having a conversation with her about a bi- person from the Bible Belt about homophobic mm-hmm. church who's trans and black. That's interesting. <laughs> you know, you don't do that all the time. So, you know, there's all these reasons. Yeah, no, I mean, you could just definitely feel the trust that you have with everyone but with those three individuals in particular but I think it was definitely the scenes where I can only imagine especially with uh you being a filmmaker and a friend to Crystal just open just seeing her open up with her family um and the trust that had to be involved with that um because that was a choice of her just wanting to continue this pathway of uh love and family because those are just the core values that she um places so much high esteem to. And I'm sure that you both place high esteem to as well. Yeah, big time. I've had a lot of Black trans women come to my rescue, especially when I was much younger, you know? And um, Mm -hmm. yeah, like going to talk to her family and being her friend and not being able to say anything against them and learning what empathy really means, what radical empathy really is, and like, and, and getting the chance to imagine a world where we all can do this, we can all listen to each other, and find maybe not the middle ground, but some common ground to continue the conversation, you know? Um, it was, it was really triggering for me and intense for me, but I'm grateful to Crystal for having the generosity to offer that to the world, you know? Right. No, it's just kind of like what Crystal's aunt said, which was, you got to give your roses now while they're still living. Um, So absolutely. Um, But I guess with that, um, my next question actually is similar to, I guess, the topic of friendship, which is like, what did you learn um, making this movie? And how did your, how did the friendships impact how you both work, how you both work together, and just how you, how it carries in your everyday life now? Oh, wow. Um, you know, well, friend- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, I, I mean, first off, you know, 
I've been, I'm from I became a filmmaker through the military, so I have a very um, rigid. It's strange. I'm rigid and flexible. It depends on what topic you get get me on as a filmmaker. But I have a very clear purpose to every movie that I make, and I have rules for myself on every film. So I try my very best to be committed to the actual of what was happening versus the way that I would want to show it as a black queer person. Like a lot of times, you know, you get caught up on the politics of respectability and you, you know, I think, you know, even a mode of self-criticism, you know, some of the collaboration on my house for me left me a bit cold because it's presumed that it's the responsibility of the person of color to explain themselves to the audience so that the audience can then connect to their humanity when to me, everybody brushes their teeth, everybody, you know, washes up, everybody puts on clothes to present themselves to the world. So why do I need to tell you that, you know, a house is a bunch of homeless gay kids? You know what I'm saying? Like, of course, if you just look, you'll see that that's what it is, you know? So with all of that, you know, I, I really wanted to create a space in our collaboration to where friendship can be um, the guiding tool and principle. Crystal, like Chester said, told me very early in the production that I had to be her friend in order to have access to her life because she needed friends. And I said, okay, if the camera is a friend, then the camera is first person. If the camera is a friend, the camera is always on the side of the people who has their back. There is no, there are no subject matter experts. There are no celebrities, although I think Crystal's a celebrity and Deshaun's a celebrity and all of them are celebrities, but you know, it's not like a lot of documentaries you see nowadays where it's like, oh, we're gonna talk about queer rights and we're gonna front load it with every A-list actress you've ever heard of. So, cause we know that the only way you will ever care about this is if Jennifer Aniston says drag queens are cool or, you know, whatever people are doing, you know, and I, but that's not what friends do. Yeah, I think to add to that too, as artists every day, we acknowledge that we're human and that we're existing, mm -hmm. you know, the day of. And, you know, I think that like movies like Great Gardens where you dig in a per into a person and you see them, you know, and you just put the camera on in the room and you just catch something. Like there's a lot of moments like that in Pure Kids, you know, where the camera is just rolling and you see things. And, you know, uh, really wanting, wanting to, wanting to experience, you know, that person's life, I guess, on film, you know, I, I guess that's like the, the relationship with the character that you start to build with the character and building with characters. Yeah. More to play in that process. Yeah. We're friends first. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything that's going to hurt you. Yeah. But if you hurt yourself, I'm going to be there and be like, why did you do that? You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> no, it's, it's just really rare to see that type of closeness, especially with a filmmaker being involved, because I think we've been so, um, so conditioned to just be objective as, po as possible when it comes to uh, filmmaking, especially documentary filmmaking, although, you know, this movie does kind of border this like narrative slash uh, documentary filmmaking. But uh, we just are so conditioned to be, be objective as possible. And here you are, um, just even just by the very first scene, the very first um, piece of dialogue is you ask for a lighter, um, just to be involved with these people's lives and the like. So I'm glad to hear that these uh, friendships are monumental and will um, forever just be a part of your everyday's lives. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, um, with that, my next question actually was going to be about the interviewing process that you did. What was your um, thought process of um, actually just, you know, on the fly interviewing with these people versus, I guess, just um, kind of leaving a be? It's a mixture of things. I think when I first started making the movie, I, I come to it from the Marine Corps. And in the Marine Corps, Art is very didactic. It's very like, this is what a movie is. And you sit them here and you light it this way. And you ask them these five questions. And, you know, I had come out of being homeless before the Marines. So you know, it was kind of like a cultish thing. You know, I kind of had given over a lot of my agency, right, to the, these kind of didactic processes. And then that's when Crystal, after a month of filming with me, was like, listen, I'm not going to sit in this corner and answer the same 15 questions over and over again. 
You either mm -hmm. be my friend and come live my life with me or leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you anymore, you know? And yeah. Yeah, I think that formed a sense of innocence too, or like a veil of innocence that like, you know, helped um, guide that process, I guess, more as well. Right. And then as I start, and then the other thing is too, is that like I'm experiencing a very uh, heavy uh, and and voluminous education on documentary and photography at this time. So I'm in school, right? So I'm watching all these docs that have now poured into this from like films like uh, is it? I think it's uh, I can't remember the name of it now. But anyway, Grant's March or something like that. Mikhail's March, something like that. Like a raw film about breaking up with girlfriends, Verite Doc, and Grey Gardens, and all the other movies we've mentioned. So you know. I'm realizing that there's another way to tell the story. I bought a bunch of books, you know, kind of start teaching myself some things like, oh, I can, like, for instance, I think like triple shot technique, right? Because there are many altercations, uh, intellectual altercations. Not, I didn't really like to do physical violence, you know, but more so just people disagreeing that happened that didn't make it into the film. And I would film them like, why doesn't it feel in this footage like it felt when I was in the room? So then I got this book on cinematography for documentary and in it, it talked about triple shot technique where if you, you see an event happening in real life, you film it at least three times from three radically different angles for the amount of time it takes you to become bored with it. And then now you go and cut that and you can actually get the fight across to the audience. Yeah, I also remember what I was yeah. gonna say, the instance point of view and like being nosy too and like yes. like a child yes. like you know how a child asks you all these questions and they keep asking you questions and then you realize like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 i feel like you know elegance being there she'd be like hold on girl are you sure like you know, <laughs> like, you know holding crystal responsible for her own like everything that's happening while filming too and self-responsible like, so that innocent, like that gaze, I guess, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. But um, no, I just, I, I think the, again, I think the, the bias that you have, again, because you, you come from the background that you are actually a kid yourself just really shows. And I think it's rare to see that site. I'm really glad that just formulated there as is. Um, do you have any um, updates on uh, Crystal, Deshaun, and just the um, the peer and any other peer kids that you've had in contact with? Crystal is married in Pennsylvania. She does Q and A's with us often. Um, we're Casper, we're married. Yeah, we're married. That Casper, happens. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> Casper <laughs> is uh, he passed away in the movie during filming quickly after. Well shortly after like his second interview actually. Mm -hmm. Deshaun is currently incarcerated. Our last communications with him was I think the summer of 2019. Yeah, he was mad at me for taking so long to finish. I'm oh, sorry, the fall of 2000, actually no, the fall of 2018, 18, 18. 18. the fall yeah. of 2018. Um, uh, Cheetah, the one who got with Anaya, who this whole village is a world within a world, that line. Um, unfortunately, he passed due to AIDS, probably about, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 people. I mean, probably more than that, actually, like 70, 80 people that I was connected to through this film passed from AIDS and AIDS related things during that time. Mm -hmm. um, who else? Um, yeah, like I said, we got married, I went to film school. Sorry, other, other things. Also, I think an important thing to say is we consider ourselves a part of their community as much as they can, like, you know, like it's as yeah. much as they, we consider them a part of, like, you know, vice versa. Yeah. They consider, you know, ourselves a part of them and their selves a part of ours. Like, yeah. you know, uh, and the, that's the white men are fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we didn't even touch about, um, like white finance guy like what was that about did you have actually a lot of instances to where like people would come in because it is a public space but people would come in and wanted to just you know be part of the footage and you had to like you know 
whether it be like escalating or confronting them, it's just like, no, this is like not part of it. Or it's just like, you know, you actually including the footage because you thought it was relevant. Well, I mean, with the white guys, you know, they, I just, that was not the first time that, or the last time, this is, this happens to me often when I'm shooting my house. Mm -hmm. White people see me directing a scene in public and be like, oh, this is about me. And I'll just walk in the frame and, and like, hey, what are you guys doing here? Like, yeah. Like there's a police or something like I'm like it's strange to see someone like you doing this here. Let me ask you why you're here, you know. Um, so that happened, and I and I thought it was, and I got I used to get so upset, and then I realized that um, you know I have a story to tell, and a part of the story is how we are seen when we are seen, right? Because I think people think invisibility when they hear the invisibility conversation around identity. The idea is, is that you are totally invisible, like a ghost walking through life. And it's kind of like a ghost in that when you become too problematic, white people treat you like you're haunting them, you know? Mm -hmm. and like, like Ghostbusters, I don't know. That's that's a very different take on racism than I've probably ever given before. But, um, <laughs> but you know, so when you're with the, the characters in this film, you're really truly, with these white men too. Like we are all in this space together. We are all figuring each other out. And I realized that I couldn't just be angry at them, that I had to find a way to engage them so that other people who are like them can hear maybe inner thoughts that they don't really admit out loud said by someone. And then they'll be like, oh, wow, that, that doesn't work. I shouldn't do that anymore, I'm gonna stop. You know? Um, and I thought it was interesting that you talked about Obama and how it places things in time. Um, but to be honest with you, I think what this movie is mostly about is about agency, right? I'm following people who people assume have no choice in the things that they do. And it was important to me from that, that, that kind of prompt that I got from Crystal to be friends is to say that like, you know, my friends, I celebrate the choices that they make. I don't necessarily glamorize those choices but I revel in those choices because I think those choices are what free will, whatever little bit of free will that you might have access to is, I think that is the thing that defines the human condition, the ability to do something else, but the need to do what you're doing and how people navigate that tension between those two states, right? So I wanted to revel in their agency. I wanted to revel in their choice. And by allowing these white men to have space, I, you know, you have a choice to see the world this way. I'm, I'm trying to work off of this principle, like, like God fears sex, right? God I was taught to believe in is, you know, omniscient and all forgiving and, and has an incredible capacity for patience and a belief that human beings can do better. But he forces you to face yourself and to, to admit your faults and to humble yourself. And I try to create space for that type of agency, for that type of kind of like dialogue, uh, in, that internal dialogue to become palpable to the audiences so that people can might see these kids a different way, you know, see themselves a different way when around them, especially. No, those are, that's a really good takeaway just for us to really reflect on in terms, I guess, like what is agency? What could agency mean for us on a, on a micro level, but of course on a macro level too. So no, I mean, that's great, but, um, but no, it's, it really has been um, such, such a pleasure to have this conversation with you both um, about this really incredible film. Um, we hope that everyone um, can see it. And for those that uh, who already seen it, thank you so much, um, Sister and um, Elegance. Thank you. Thank you. Having us. Thank you, Houston. Yeah. Yeah. Love to Meg the Stallion and the Houston Rockets. <laughs> Yeah, and one more shout out to the incredible Houston Cinema Art Society for their amazing programming. Um, uh, can tell everyone to watch Pure Kids and then tell everyone to watch everything else that they program. Thank you. Oh, oh and shout out to uh, Terrence uh, Nance. Shout oh, out to Terrence Nance. Our executive producer. Yes. He's from Houston. That's right. Shout out to Terrence. That's right. Big shout out to Terrence. We love you, Terrence. Love you, Terrence. There we go. There we go. Got to keep, keep the Houston crowd going. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>